The Peter Schiff Show. Well, it looks like the correction in the U.S. stock market, and by correction, I am referring to the rally, the first correction in what I believe is a new bear market. But it's looking like that correction may have finally run its course as the stock market has run into a wall of overhead resistance. And in fact, the technical action on Monday was quite telling because early in the morning, we opened um, quite a bit higher, uh, 100 points or so higher, and then had a 350 point reversal to the downside. The catalyst for the initial rally was yet another rumor of an impending trade deal with China. And it seems to me that we've basically run out of uh, the ability to continue to rally the market by regurgitating the same news story over and over again. Remember I was saying that when we actually have a trade deal with China, my thinking would be it would be a buy the rumor, sell the fact. Well, the problem is traders have already bought that rumor over and over and over again that they may have already sold the last rumor. They can't wait for the fact. They've just had so many rumors that now they've sold the last rumor, and it doesn't even matter if we get a deal. The market is going to sell off. Of course, if we get no deal at all, then the market could sell off even more because a great deal has already been priced into the market. But there isn't going to be a great deal. There will be a deal. Uh, there will be nothing great about it. There will be probably nothing substantive about it. Expectations have been raised so high, which is another reason that I don't think Trump is as good a negotiator uh, as he pretends. Remember, the idea is to lower expectations, to promise a little, but then deliver a lot. But when you overpromise and underdeliver, which I think Trump is going to do, that's not a good strategy. And especially if you let your negotiating partners realize that you've already taken credit for a deal, well, now you don't really have the leverage to walk away from a deal uh, when the markets are already so invested in a deal coming out. But the technical action, you know, continued over the last couple of days today, in particular, uh, the Dow down again, I think it's the third day in the row. The Russell 2000, uh, the biggest loser on the day now down, uh, I think it was about 2% on the day. So the market in general is weakening. Gold looks like it's kind of holding on to uh, the um, the losses and not extending the losses beyond what we've already seen. We're still hanging out around 1290 on the price of gold. Dollar index, which had rallied, isn't adding to its gains. To me, the dollar should be going down. The, um, the price of gold should be going up, but you still have a lot of people stubbornly hanging on to the, the fallacy that the U.S. economy is still strong and the fact that the Fed is no longer hiking rage and no longer going to be shrinking its balance sheet on autopilot, the idea that that is somehow going to add to the strength of the economy. All of this is belied by the economic data that continues to be released, uh, most of which uh, below expectations, in particular, the, uh, the news that we're getting on trade. And for all the excitement and enthusiasm that Donald Trump is going to deliver this fantastic trade deal, everybody keeps overlooking the fact that the trade picture continues to deteriorate. In fact, we got the trade deficit numbers for December, and it was a whopper. We're talking about a record trade deficit the prior month. November was initially reported at $49.3 billion deficit. And we ended up with a deficit of $50.3 billion. But the real shocker was the January number, which was already expected to balloon to $57.6 billion. Instead, it went all the way up to $59.8 billion in the month of December alone. And my guess is they're going to revise that upward. I bet we crack the $60 billion number when they do the revision. But as it stands right now, they now have all the data for the, the year of uh, 2018. And it's an all-time record. The, the deficit for the year 
$891 billion. That is a $70 billion increase over the deficit in 2017, a 12.5% increase. That is a record. That is the largest deficit we have ever had in a, a single year. And that is with oil prices relatively low. You know, oil around 40 or $50 a barrel. Not sure what the exact average was for 2018. But the last time we had deficits this size in 2008, 10 years ago, oil was like $140 a barrel. And we were importing a lot more of it because we weren't producing as much oil ourselves. That was before the, the fracking boom. So the fact that we're now running higher deficits, even with a lot more domestic oil production and lower oil prices for our imports, that just shows you how much the rest of our trade balance has deteriorated. Uh, over that period of time. And imagine what's going to happen to this trade deficit when oil prices really start to rise when the dollar falls. And of course, a lot of people are blaming the trade deficit on the strong dollar. The dollar did not strengthen in 2018. I mean, the dollar in 2018 is about the same as it was in 2017. So you can't blame the increasing trade deficit on the strong dollar. In fact, when the dollar resumes its decline, which it is going to do, the initial impact on the trade deficit is going to be to worsen it. That's going to be because a weak dollar is going to mean everything we import is going to cost us more money. We're going to need more dollars to buy stuff when the dollar goes down. And it's going to work the reverse on our exports. We're not going to earn as much foreign currency from our exports. And so a weakening dollar is going to lead to bigger trade deficits in the short run. Now, in the long run, if the dollar weakens enough, of course, Americans will be so broke, we'll be priced out of a lot of markets, and we're going to have to stop buying stuff. But that is a long way away. We're going to see this number move up. In fact, I think for... 2019, we could have the first year where our trade deficit is $1 trillion for the year. And now we're going to be talking about $1 trillion trade deficits and $1 trillion budget deficits. And I'm going to get to the budget deficits after I finish talking about the trade deficits because we got bad news there as well. But of course, you know, number one, all of this shows that Trump is just lying or clueless when he talks about how we're now winning on trade. Remember, I pointed this out. There were many speeches that Trump gave, many tweets, where he said that now that he's president, we're winning again, we're winning on trade, we're making progress on trade. Based on what are we winning on trade? If the trade deficits under Trump have never been bigger, what have we won? And, you know, Donald Trump imposed tariffs, right? We got tariffs on steel, aluminum, solar panels, washing machines, all kinds of stuff. Yet the trade deficit went up. Now, is Trump going to argue that if it wasn't for these tariffs, it would have gone up by an even bigger amount? And so we're winning because the deficit only increased by 12.5%. So this is all proof that Trump is just talking. Right. We have made no progress on trade. The trade deficit has widened, not narrowed, despite the tariffs that have been imposed and despite all this negotiation. Meanwhile, you know, we got again these horrible trade numbers that came out today. No impact on the foreign exchange market, no impact on the precious metals market because nobody cares. Now, maybe one reason nobody cares is because they think that Trump's going to solve the problem with this great new deal that he's going to negotiate. Now, that's all a bunch of wishful thinking. That's not going to happen. Maybe more likely people just don't believe the trade deficit is a problem. I mean, they used to believe it was a problem back in the 1980s and 1990s when the problem was much smaller. But I guess because it's you know, become a gigantic problem without any immediate negative ramifications, at least, you know, when you look at the stock market or something like that, maybe people think, well, it's just not a problem. In fact, most of the reporting of the trade deficit that I heard today basically was because of our strong economy, right? We have a trade deficit because our economy is so much stronger than our trading partners. And so we're sucking in all of these imports. And that's the same nonsense that they keep on regurgitating, but it's all wrong. Strong economies 
produce surpluses. When you have a really strong economy, you're producing more stuff than you need. Your economy is so strong. You're so productive. Your factories are cranking out so much stuff that you can't even buy it all. And you're able to, to export your surplus, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, any business, let's say you're, you're running a farm, right? And you have a farming business. And let's say at the end of the year, you actually had to import food. You had to go into debt to buy some food. You weren't even growing enough food to feed your own family, right? Would you say, oh, this is because, you know, my, my farm is booming? I mean, our, my, my, my family is, you know, we're so strong, we're eating so much that we couldn't even grow enough to satisfy our hunger. So we're, we're, we're so prosperous, we had to borrow money to, to buy food from other farms. No, I mean, obviously, if your family farm is booming, it's like, you know, we produce so much food, we couldn't even eat it all. We had all this extra food, right? And so we were able to sell the extra food to other people. And now, you know, we've accumulated all this wealth because we sold our surplus. That would be a strong farm. The same thing for a country. A strong economy doesn't have to take on debt to consume and sustain itself. If we were a strong economy, we would be generating surpluses and we would be accumulating assets, right? So this is all nonsense. Our economy is so strong. You know, what about all the years where the Japanese economy was booming and the German economy was booming and they had trade surpluses? Or what about years in the past when America had stronger economy? We had stronger GDP growth than we have now, yet we had trade surpluses. What did that mean? Right. This is all a rationalization. Uh, people trying to pretend that uh, that that we have a strong economy. These trade deficits are a sign of a weak economy. You know, it's not a coincidence that the last time that we had trade deficits around this large was 2008, just before the financial crisis. Were the big trade deficits we had in early 2008 or 2007, were they a sign of a healthy economy? No, they were a sign of a bubble economy. They were a sign that there was a big problem, yet nobody on Wall Street recognized the problem. They thought everything was great. It wasn't great. And the 2008 financial crisis proved it wasn't great. The trade deficit finally began to shrink after the crisis. Well, we're making the same mistake now. We have an even bigger bubble now than we had then. And so as a result, we have even bigger trade deficits. This is all a consequence of the bubble. This is what happens when you're living beyond your means, when you have a phony economy and you rely on debt, right? You, you borrow more debt to consume. And these huge imbalances are a sign of a problem. Just like the enormous budget deficits that we have right now are a sign of a problem. Look, if the U.S. economy was great, uh, businesses and individual workers would be flooding the U.S. government with taxes. Everybody would be paying more taxes on higher incomes, you know, on, on more production, on more capital gains. And the U.S. government would not be spending as much money on welfare, on food stamps, on unemployment all these built-in so-called economic stabilizers, right? So we would have a smaller deficit or maybe even a surplus. Well, we just got the numbers for the first four months of the fiscal year, and the deficit is now $310 billion. And that is the official deficit. Remember, that's not how much money the government actually borrowed during those four years. That's how much money the government pretends that it borrowed because it's only counting what's on budget and it's ignoring all the stuff that's off budget. You know, in a few years, I bet the off budget spending is going to exceed the on budget. We're probably going to have a bigger deficit that's not counted than the one that we report. But if you just look at what they report, we are up uh, $310 billion in four months. That is a 77% increase in the money that we borrowed a year ago. The same period last year, the deficit is now 77% bigger than it was then. And this is during supposedly a booming economy. The first year that we've ever had uh, more than 3% GDP growth, right? It's 3.1%. If the initial estimate holds up for Q4, we'll have 3.1% uh, economic growth, the most since 2005, 
yet the budget deficit is up by 77% already over the same period last year uh, when we had economic growth about, what, 50% less, 2.2, wherever it was uh, uh, for, for last year. Now, is that a sign that the economy is so much better than it was a year before? No. If the economy was better, the deficit would have come down. The same thing for individuals. Individual credit card debt is booming. Auto debt is booming. Student loans booming. Corporate debt is booming. Everybody is going deeper and deeper into debt, yet the government keeps telling us we're more and more prosperous, right? The economy is booming, yet our debt is booming, not our assets, not our net worth, right? Our debt, our liabilities are exploding. And I, I've talked about this many, many times. I've used that analogy. In fact, it's such a good analogy that Jeff Gunlock has used it himself again when he's describing it. But going into debt is not a sign of economic health. Right? If you if you run into an old buddy of yours from college and you ask him, hey, how you doing? And he starts telling you about all the debt he has, about all the credit card debt he has, about the second and third mortgage he put on his house, about the fact that he's, you know, maxed out all his credit cards and, you know, uh, and, and borrowed against his retirement savings, you know, and then he tells you he's doing great. That's not a guy that's doing great. A guy that's doing great is a guy that paid off his debt. Right? He doesn't have any debt, doesn't ha- owe any money on his credit cards, owns his cars you know, free and clear, paid off his home mortgage, has a lot of retirement savings. Look, when people are doing well, they save. It's when they're not doing well that they're forced to borrow. Right? There's an old expression too, saving for a rainy day. That means when it's a sunny day, when times are good, that's when you're able to save so that when times are bad, you have something to fall back on. Think about this. We are almost at a record uh, length in how long this economic expansion has been going. Yet everybody is loaded up with debt. We're running record amounts of debts. The government has record debt. Corporations have record debt. Americans have record debt, individuals. And this is after a huge run of supposed prosperity. How are we going to handle the next economic downturn if we're so indebted now, right? The sun has been shining all these years and we've saved nothing. And now we're going to get a long overdue rainstorm and we have got nothing, right? How are we going to handle it? If Americans have saved nothing when they were employed, right? Working, had jobs, when they lose their job, what are they going to tap into? How are they going to make ends meet during the next recession? They're not. We have never been more ill-prepared for a recession than we are now because the recovery that we supposedly enjoyed was a recovery in name only because we didn't recover. If we actually had legitimate economic growth, Americans would have used that growth to pay down debt to pay down money they borrowed when times were tough. All of a sudden, times are good. They can pay off their debt. They can pay down their mortgages, right? The government could have run years of surpluses. I mean, even under the old Keynesian model, right, of priming the pump with deficit spending, you were supposed to pay off those deficits when the economy was good. You were supposed to use the surpluses from a strong economy to finance the deficits in a weak economy. But if we're having record deficits in a weak economy, how are we going to expand those deficits and make them even bigger during the next downturn? Because, of course, if we go into recession, and, you know, we've already got the Atlanta Fed now, I think they're at 0.5. They notched it up 0.3 for their estimate for Q1 GDP. But remember, the last couple of years, Uh, You know, wherever the Atlanta Fed started, they always ratcheted it down quite a bit. So based on the last couple of years, uh, if you look at, you know, where where the Atlanta Fed has been, we're probably going to end up with negative uh, growth uh, in the first quarter of 2019. So this may be the beginning of the recession. But if we go into recession this year, whenever we go into recession, you know that everybody is going to be calling for a stimulus. They're going to say we need a fiscal stimulus. Well, what have we had? We've had massive fiscal stimulus during the boom. The huge deficits that we've been running 
during the boom have constituted a fiscal stimulus. And now what? We're supposed to make the stimulus even bigger during the recession? We've had monetary stimulus. Yes, even though the Fed has been tightening, look at how low interest rates still are. I mean, that is still a stimulus. It's just not as large a stimulus as the economy needed, given how big the addiction was to cheap money, right? They were dialing back the dosage and we were going into withdrawal. But if we have to relaunch fiscal and monetary stimulus based on where we are, which we are going to do, right, this whole thing is going to blow up. Now, we got some more uh, bad economic data that people are ignoring. Look at the construction spending number for December. Now, for some reason, everybody was expecting an increase. They were looking for a 0.3% gain in December construction spending. Instead, uh, we dropped by 0.6. And the year-over-year change in spending went from up 34 to now up just 1.6. So weak numbers in uh, construction spending. That's going to continue. Now, we're going to get, of course, the the jobs report for February is going to come out on Friday, right? It'll be the first Friday in March, and we're going to get that number. We got the uh, ADP, private sector number, uh, today, and and that number was um, expected to come out at about 180, 190,000. They revised the prior month all the way up from 213,000 to 300,000. Not really sure uh, how they did that. I think that's following the, the number that we had from uh, the, the government. But the actual number came in at 103,000. So obviously quite a big reduction in the pace of job gains that we got the prior month. So we'll see what we get on Friday. One of these days, we're going to get a bad number. I mean, we're, you know, we're always one report away from a bad number on jobs, a spike up in unemployment claims. I mean, that's kind of the last thing that everybody is hanging their hat on as really evidence of a strong economy is this supposedly low official unemployment rate. Uh, but of course, we know the real unemployment rate is quite a bit higher than the official rate. Uh, but even the official rate is going to start to back up and we're going to start to see a lot of payroll jobs. First, we're going to see a big reduction in the number of jobs added. But as employers really start to lose this false optimism and start to hunker down and prepare for the recession that's been staring them in the face, but they didn't recognize it, we are going to see a lot of layoffs, particularly to in the housing sector. We also got some numbers on new home sales, which at first blush, uh, the number came out better than expected for December. There are 516,000 versus a 590,000 expectations. But if you look at the revisions, they took back the November number, which originally was reported at up 657,000, and they knocked 58,000 off that number. They brought it back down to 599. So if you take the two combined, it was a net negative because the combined numbers uh, were less than had been expected. But what's more significant is that the slowdown is there in new home uh, sales, new home construction. The housing market is losing air. You know, it got a little bit of a reprieve because we got a, a, a move down in mortgage rates based on the Fed backing away from future rate hikes and backing away from, you know, continuing its quantitative tightening. But ultimately, I think the weakness in the dollar that is going to result from the realization that the economy is much weaker than people think and that the Fed is going to be taking interest rates back to zero and relaunching quantitative easing, uh, that is going to cause uh, commodity prices to rise. Uh, U.S. inflation, which is already rising, is going to pick up. Oil prices are going to rise. And I don't think that people are going to want to own U.S. treasuries. You can already see that internationally. The appetite for U.S. treasuries is waning at a time when our trade deficits are exploding and our budget deficits are exploding. So I think supply is going to trump uh, the Fed's easy posture. And we're going to see a, a, a move up in long-term interest rates, which is just going to exacerbate the severity of this coming recession. In fact, I was watching an interview with Kyle Bass. I think it was on CNBC. And he said that he thought that the Fed would be back at zero by next year. And I agree with Kyle. I think we will be back at zero. We may even be there before next year. Uh, and I think we can go from two and a quarter where we are to zero in one cut. I don't know that the Fed is going to be able to do it in quarter point increments. I think it could be just one big cut. 
Uh, or maybe they'll do, you know, one Porter coin putt, and then the next one will be, you know, 200 basis points at, in one time. We'll see. But they're not going to be able to take the baby steps because this thing is going to unwind very quickly. But where I disagree with Kyle Bass' analysis is he seems to think that the greater problems are abroad and that the U.S. is just going to get caught up in a global recession and that our recession is going to be mild on a relative basis. And he also thinks that the U.S. stock market is going to go down. But again, he looks at external forces as being the primary driver. And I think he's got it backwards. I think it's the U.S. economy that is going to be the focal point of this downturn. And I think that the reversal in monetary policy that we're going to see, the Fed going back to zero and the Fed resuming quantitative easing, that is going to have a stimulative effect, not in the U.S. economy, but in the global economy. Because I believe that the main uh, drag on the global economy has been the specter of a rising dollar, rising U.S. interest rates, and rising U.S. budget deficits that are crowding out investment capital for emerging markets. The belief that the Fed was going to sit back and not only not monetize all this debt, but add to the liquidity drain by you know, draining its own balance sheet, the idea that all of this capital was going to come from the rest of the world, that is what was dragging down the global economy. And so I think when the world becomes less optimistic on the U.S. economy, and in fact more realistic, on their outlook for the U.S. economy. When the dollar starts to fall, that is going to ease financial conditions outside of the United States. That is going to be a gigantic relief. And there's going to be a big relief rally in emerging markets, in commodities, because now uh, the dollar is not going to be strengthening. The dollar is going to be falling. That is going to be reducing the real value of dollar-denominated debts. So countries that have dollar debt It's like that debt gets forgiven. It's easier to repay it. It's easier to service it. A lot of countries that have import costs denominated in dollars, raw material costs in dollars, these costs are going to go down. And as foreign currencies start to rise, all of a sudden foreign markets become appealing from an investment perspective. The the thought that the dollar would keep strengthening is what has been undermining the appeal of international investing. You know, U.S. stocks have never been this expensive relative to the rest of the world in 100 years. So that divergence is not going to go on once the currency headwinds in the rest of the world become currency tailwinds. So now all of a sudden you're going to see big investment flows into emerging markets and other economies. That is going to help their economies because that money that's coming in is going to be invested and it's going to benefit uh, uh, those economies. So This is what Kyle Bass is not seeing. He's missing this bigger point. And all of this uh, money printing, slashing interest rates, bigger deficits, a falling dollar, the stimulus is not going to take place in the United States. See, the reason it appeared to work in 2008 is when we slashed interest rates in 2008, the dollar was at a record low. Gold was at a record high. Oil was at a record high, and the speculators were caught off guard and reversed those positions, and we had a dollar rally, which helped bring down long-term interest rates, helped bring down oil prices, and and, and helped the U.S. economy. But now, it's traders are in the reverse position. Everybody's been buying the dollar. Everybody's all in on the dollar. People haven't been buying gold. They've been shorting gold. Everybody is on the wrong side of the trade. So the next time the Fed goes back to zero, goes back to QE, we're going to have the opposite reaction. The dollar is going to tank like it did between 2002 and 2008, except it's going to fall much more because the U.S. is in much worse shape now than it was then. So America is not going to benefit from this next round of stimulus. It's the rest of the world that's going to benefit. America is going to have to pay the piper for what it's been doing. All of a sudden, we're going to see rising consumer prices, rising long-term interest rates. And as our bubble deflates, our stock market is going down with it. We're going to have a lot of people who are going to get laid off because we have all these jobs 
that were a byproduct of spending borrowed money, of importing products and borrowing the money to pay for it, right? All this cheap credit, this boom, this is all going to end in a bust. All of this was malinvestment. All this stuff has to be liquidated. So we're going to see the rising unemployment. We're going to see the skyrocketing budget deficits. And the rest of the world is going to be relieved of the burden of having to pay for that, having to finance that. Everybody was prepared for the Fed to keep shrinking their balance sheet. Well, when the Fed starts another round of quantitative easing, then the burden of paying for all that debt falls on Americans. And it's not going to be because of higher taxes. It's going to be because of higher inflation, because the federal government or Federal Reserve is going to print all the money required to monetize that debt. So it's not going to be borrowed from the rest of the world. It's not going to crowd out investment internationally. It's just going to create inflation domestically. And so this next recession is going to be stagflation and inflation every recession and things couldn't be worse. And then the world is going to put two and two together on the politics of this because it's all going to be blamed on Trump, on Republicans, on tax cuts. And so if people were getting optimistic on America because they thought Trump was going to make America great again with um, lower taxes and less regulation, how are those same investors going to react to the prospect of a socialist president making America socialist again with higher taxes, more regulation? And if the debts were exploding like this, if we have record trade deficits, record budget deficits, record individual debt, record corporate debt in good times, imagine how we're going to shatter these records in bad times. And if there was no Republican opposition to big deficits when times were good, if nobody was against big deficits to fund tax cuts for the rich, well, who is going to be against big deficits when it's to fund a emergency recovery when we have all these Americans who are unemployed and highly in debt, right? Well, who's going to object to running huge deficits so that we can forgive the student loans, so that we can guarantee everybody a good job at a living wage, so that we can provide health care for everybody or maybe some other elements of the Green Do deal, right? There is going to be no fiscal responsibility left. So when investors connect those very obvious dots, uh, and this is going to be much worse than a the financial crisis that we had in 2000. I mean, that was a Sunday school picnic compared to what's coming on. And to me, again, this is so obvious now. Yes, I know it's taken a lot longer than I thought. M many more years have passed than I would have believed could have passed. But all that means is we dug ourselves into a bigger hole. We took on even more debt. The economy got even more screwed up. And the bigger the bubble is, the worse it is for everybody when it pops. And because we were able to make this bubble so much bigger, than it would have gotten had it popped five years ago. That's five more years of damage to the economy. That's five more years of debt, right? But I think that means it's a lot more money. I think that my strategy is ultimately going to return a much bigger payoff to anybody who has been following my advice because the problems that I was positioning myself to profit from have gotten much bigger. And so now the profits from those problems manifesting themselves are also going to be much bigger. The beauty is, given how many things that I've been forecasting have already come true, how many flashing lights that we have to tell us that you know the day of reckoning is close at hand, we now have an opportunity to go all in. We now have an opportunity to, to allocate more resources to this trade, to get more money out of the U.S. stock market when we still have crazy valuations, out of U.S. bond market, out of the U.S. dollar, and load up on foreign stocks that have never been this cheap relative to the U.S. in 100 years, load up on gold stocks, which have probably never been this cheap, build the perfect portfolio uh, to profit uh, from the bursting of the mother of all bubbles. How many more weeks or how many more months people have to fund an account with me or add to their account? I have no idea. I mean, I hope we have as many as possible. I'd like to get as many people in this lifeboat uh, before the Titanic sinks. So, uh, you know, if you're still contemplating it, just think about all the things that have happened, tune out all the noise, and recognize where we are. Recognize how close to 2008 we are right now. Remember how few people saw any problems right up until the point that the economy went off a cliff. Well, we're about to go off a much bigger cliff. The same people are just as clueless now 
as they were then. So before they wake up, right, before the Fed has to completely show their hand, right, don't wait for the Fed to cut rates back to zero. Don't wait for the Fed to do QE4. I don't think it'll be too late if you wait till then, right? It won't be nearly as good a time if you do it now. But if you wait till then, I think the trade is going to be a lot more expensive because the dollar is going to tank. But it's going to go down a lot more, you know, than that. So, you know, if you do it right away, it's better than not doing it all. But to me, I think it's clear sailing. I don't need any more proof. I'm 100% convinced uh, that I'm right and that we're we're very close to an inflection point. So before we get there, you know, just fortify your portfolios. If you have accounts, add more money to the accounts. If you haven't set up an account, get one set up. And we'll see what happens with this jobs number on Friday. One of these days, it's going to be a big number. I haven't seen any real indication yet that we're there. But you know what? When we do get a really bad jobs number, it's probably going to surprise everybody. And my bet is not only will we get a surprising, terrible number, but then they'll go back and revise down the prior numbers and we'll find out that those numbers were a lot worse than we were originally told. (music) 